This afternoon's Veteran History Project interview is being conducted on the afternoon of September the 19th, 2007 here at the Niles Public Library. My name is Neil O'Shea and I'm speaking with Max Kolpass. Mr. Kolpass was born on the 28th of July, 1924, and he has kindly consented to be interviewed for this project. Um, we're honored that he made the journey in today from Wooddale, and he has um, many treasured memories to share with us, and uh, um, we appreciate his uh, providing us with his memoir of service in one of the most, or most important battle in the European theater. Um, anyway, uh, Mr. Colpis, um, when did you enter the, the service? I entered the service in March of 1943, still at the age of 18. I left Crane Technical High School in Chicago and entered the Army without completing my last year of high school. I was a captain in the ROTC and head captain of the rifle team, uh, and I was the recipient of the Win William Randolph Hearst Trophy winner in National Rifle uh, Competition. I might add to that that upon returning home uh, at the in, at Thanksgiving of 1945, I went back to school on a GI Bill of Rights, completed high school in about six months, and went on to Wright College and an engineering college. Um, Mr. Colfes, was there? Um, so you were living on the west side then, were you? Uh, I was living on the northwest side northwest in the Humboldt Park area. So Humboldt Park was still going to uh, Crane then. Uh, was there any tradition of military service in the family why you chose to uh, participate in ROTC during uh, high school? No, the only reason that I participated uh, in the ROTC was I did like, you know, uh, sh rifles, guns, you know, shooting weaponry. So when you... you um, you weren't drafted. You enlisted, did you? Well, I was going to be drafted, so I went down. I says, well, they're going to get me now or sooner or later, so I might as well just go ahead and uh, get in. And um, you didn't mind being uh, entering the, the Army versus the Navy? or? Uh, well, I don't like water. You know, I mean, I like swimming, <laughs> but I, I'm really not a Navy man because when I get aboard a ship and it starts to sway and all that, I'll get a little seasick. And I feel better on the ground or in the air, but uh, yeah. the choice was the Army. Mr. Kovas, I noticed in the biographical data form that you completed for us that you were born in Lithuania. That is correct. How old were you when you came to the United Well, that's a real, States. you know, you, you ask a real good uh, question, I'll, Neil, I'll tell you. I had that down in my notes. Uh, I came from Europe, from Lithuania, at the age of nine in 1933 and then with my several years of service during the war in Europe I actually had 11 years of service uh, of time in Europe more than most other yes. uh, of our soldiers ever did. So you came to this country at the age of nine did you know English then? Or? No, 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 that was a real, I'll tell you, that's a real, real rough go. I, I got to tell you, uh, you know, you enter grammar school at the age of nine. You yes. start out with, I think, first grade. You have to learn your language. And, you know, the time that my mother and my myself and two brothers arrived here, uh, we spoke generally about four or five languages. Uh, we spoke uh, Lithuanian thoroughly, we spoke uh, Jewish, we spoke uh, uh, Russian, uh, German. So, you know, getting into this English group, it, it really made a little bit rough, you know. You're, you're, you're off to a tough start. That's amazing, isn't it? You come here at the age of, of nine, right? and then uh, nine years later, you're you've mastered English and you're able to go to defend your new country. Or, yeah, yeah uh, remarkable. In fact, I'd uh, just like to say a few more things, you know, about that. Uh, my father came here in 1929 to get himself established. And then my mother and the three of, uh, three of us were 
brought here in 1933. Uh, as you know, that was the Depression time, you know, a pretty rough go. Uh, but uh, it, it, their timing was just perfect because I still have my passport, which has the German swastika on it. And, you know, uh, the fate of the Jewish people at that time was null, nil. It was, they, you know, they were being wiped out. In fact, uh, as I discussed with you a little bit earlier, I'm a little bit interested in researching some of these things. And I went on to research and found out, uh, most unbelievable how I ran across it, which we're not going to get into right now, but I found out that my uncle, my mother's uh, brother, and his wife and two kids were awoke early in the morning. They were taken out, you know, to the forest. And uh, my aunt and the two kids were just gunned down, put into a ditch covered with lime. My uncle, his name was Herschel, very fine man. Uh, they were in the flax business. They manufactured twine. Uh, he was taken to Dachau, and I have letters from Dachau. First, they wouldn't uh, admit that he was there, but then they did find the records, and they sent them to me. And he was used as a guinea pig, uh, you know, for medical purposes, and he died. But uh, when we got out, the timing was perfect. Yeah. So you enlisted. And you chose the Army, and then you were inducted at... Uh... I was inducted at uh, Fort Sheridan in Highwood, Illinois. And I spent approximately a week there. And then we went to Camp Rucker, Alabama for basic training as combat engineers. And uh, from then, we proceeded on to maneuvers in the fields of Tennessee. Now, you know, when I told my parents I was an engineer, they thought I was really going to get a good education. But I can tell you one thing about the combat engineers. They're just a backup outfit for anyone who needs help, the infantry, the tank corps, anybody that needs manpower, needs something built, needs something destroyed. That's what the combat engineers is all about. It's a lot of hard work. You're not necessarily building bridges or something. Or, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, we're building bridges. We're building bridges over the rivers, pontoon boat uh, bridges. We're building Bailey bridges. We're building trestle bridges. They go up, and when they're done, like on the Baileys that are out of metal, iron, we take them down to use them again. Others are just destroyed after they're put up. Yeah. So. Um, your family would they understood your reasons for wanting to to uh, to enlist and well, participate in the war? They and no, they weren't really happy about me, you know, uh, going into the service for fear of I'd never come back. But you know, I promised my mother when I left and walked out on Rockwell Street and headed for the streetcar that I was returning, and I don't break my promises. And you kept. I kept my promise. Yeah. So um, that was probably your, was that the first time you were away from your American home for a, an extended period of time? Yeah, they were really happy to get rid of me in a sense, too, because, you know, uh, at that time we had our fourth member of the family born uh, just a few years prior, and uh, it was a girl. They needed the room, and I slept in the kitchen. I was up the first one for <coughs> breakfast, but, boy... People coming in and out of the kitchen, you can't get too much good sleep there. Yeah. So you um, did you find boot camp hard or basic training? No, I had no trouble adjusting to boot camp or, uh, you know, uh, training. Uh, I, I always try to do my best, you know, uh, during the tr uh, period in the service. Uh, I learned one thing quickly, which, you know, you change your mind about, uh, and, and that's when they ask for volunteers, don't volunteer for anything. You know, if they ask you if you want to take a, a, a bus tour or to get on a truck and, get, and you know, ride around in the truck and all that, there's going to be a lot of work attached to that. Just don't volunteer. If you have to do it, you do it. 
Interesting. Okay. And then after we left, uh, uh, you know, Camp Rucker, Alabama, and the maneuvers, uh, we got in a train, and uh, we headed uh, for uh, Needles, California. And there, it was uh, Camp Iron Mountain, and we went there to specialize in desert training. Uh, the nights were brutally hot, a uh, cold, I'm sorry. The days were brutally hot and the nights were, you know, quite cold. And there was rattlesnakes and tarantulas and uh, all those good things running around all over. And we always had to keep our clothes on, shirts on and everything else to keep from getting, you know, burnt by the sun. After we so you're still are you, at this time you're still in you're already in the combat engineers. Yeah, this yeah. is all combat engineers. And all so the time. you had your boot camp or whatever at Camp Rucker. Camp Rucker, Alabama. Camp Rucker, and now you're out in California. Now we're out in Needles, California, the Desert Training Center. Desert training. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wonder why they were training you in desert. Well, the reason North they Africa were or? North Africa was the answer. You got the right answer, and we found that out after we boarded our ships in Boston to so prepare us from Boston. Boston. Yeah. yeah. And I'll tell you something very funny about uh, that departure. Uh, first of all, before boarding the ship, which was the, uh, well, they call them a USAT, which is a United States Army Transport, uh, I thought that this ship was going to take us out to where we got on a boat, you know, that would make it across the Atlantic. No way did I think that this thing that I was on <laughs> was was going to take us to Europe. No, oh. no, no. Because when I came from from Europe to the United States, we left uh, out of Hamburg, Germany, and that was in 1933. That was a ship. This thing was like a nothing, and it was loaded to the hilt, you know, with troops. But before they let me aboard, there was a... Uh, person taking a roll call or you know, officer and uh, he looked at my papers and he says uh, I see you were born in Lithuania I says yeah he says are you a citizen I says yeah my, I, I said I'm a citizen because my parents already passed their citizenship and I was a minor and due to that it makes me a citizen automatically he says can you prove it I said, yeah. I said, I'll tell you what. Why don't you send me back to Chicago? He says, get on board. He says, that's that's it. You, that's it. You know, get aboard ship. Well, when we got aboard uh, that uh, U.S. Explorer, uh, it took us about uh, ten days uh, to arrive to Scotland. Slow going. Uh, well, it's not that it's slow going, Neil. It's uh, they zigzag all zigzag the time. Zigzag to avoid the. And then uh, in January we had terrible weather. The waves were, uh, I don't know how high, but high, high. And unfortunately, we lost one man overboard because as the ship was swaying from side to side, he couldn't hold on when he got to the rails, the ropes, and he just went over. But he was dead about, uh, you know, at the time he hit the water. So uh, they, and, and you couldn't stop. Uh, you he would have died. He would have died from impact and, the, and the, uh, you know, the, the the temperature of the water would have killed them, and you know the ships up there pretty high. Too. Were you in a convoy or more than one? Well, yeah, we were. Yeah, I was just getting to that. We were actually in a 140 ship convoy. We had everything from aircraft carriers with their wings pulled up, you know, with planes aboard, any kind of craft that you could think of. And uh, you know, the thing is, you were to be very, very careful because there are submarines in those waters. And you can't throw anything over or, you know, uh, do anything that would give you away. And the course was always, uh, you know, uh, zigzagging. But on about the fifth day out, we noticed a big change. Part of the convoy turned to the right, and the other one just turned over in the opposite direction. The one that I was in went to England, Scotland. The other one went to North Africa. So this is the number of ships we had, 140 in that convoy. We, we checked it, uh, you know, uh, pretty carefully. 
after we got to Scotland, did you come into Glasgow or someplace? Yeah, like actually, that? A, actually, uh, you're right. That's where it was, and uh, there were some uh, oh people to meet us there uh, from the uh, USO, uh, whatever. They gave us uh, meat pies. I thought they were real pies. First time I ever had a meat pie. Yeah, I bit into one of those and I threw the rest of it away. I'll tell you, it wasn't my thing. I thought they were fruit pies. But anyway, they took us uh, over to England and it was along the uh, channel and we, let, we actually wound up in the area of Weymouth, uh, England. Uh, that was... It's way in the south, right? Oh, yeah, that's, that's yeah. right on the water. Right. It's right on the water. So is that by train and or bus or truck? Or? No, no, no. We went by train again. By train, yeah. yeah. By train again. And uh, that's where we started our uh, training for the invasion of uh, Nazi-occupied uh, Europe. So when you're... When all of, when you're with your your um, fellow soldiers in the in the boat, you you have this sense of, hey, we're going over and we're going in. I mean, did you know what was probably no? Well, there's no question about it. That, yeah. you know, we were stacked up like sardines. You know, it's uh, like uh, oh, uh, they were uh, canvas uh, cots, but they were on racks. You could stack four or five, you know, on the sides of the boats and wherever you could sleep. Uh, but we knew that uh, this was, we were there for the purpose of, you know, uh, getting or starting and definitely important of getting Hitler, you know, out of there. Did you have any preference, North Africa, England? Didn't make any? Well, uh, I didn't care if it was North Africa or England, but I didn't want to go to the South Pacific. That I didn't want to go, you know, Guadalcanal and all these areas of, you know, uh, fighting with the Japanese. I felt that uh, coming from Europe, uh, I know what the climate is like. Yeah. And the people would be more humane. Mm -hmm. And uh, it would be a place that I could understand some of that language. So uh, it'd be easier yeah. for me. The Army never tried to make use of any of your language skills. or Only on uh, occasions where there were uh, some German uh, prisoners involved and things yeah. like that, but not as an interpreter. No, uh, I was definitely uh, selected and uh, trained for demolition and uh, rifle uh, marksmanship and, yeah. train and teaching marksmanship. Yeah. In the service, see that talent that you showed in in high school with the rifling, right? That carried through and was recognized to a degree. It was definitely helpful and uh, recognized by uh, seeing your performance when you're, you know, on the target range. Uh, it helped me uh, become a non-commissioned officer almost night. I think by the time I left Camp Rucker, Alabama. I was a sergeant already, you know, and that's 90 days. God, if I had an education and knew what I was doing, I could have been one of somebody else's helper, you know, in the officer group. But, uh, you know, I'm back, and that's basically, yeah. you know, what counts. So that, uh, the trip over, where you, the 10 days is a long time. This must have seemed like a long time. It's a hell of a long time. A lot of seasickness. Yeah. A lot of, throwing up and you know you have the bags and everything else and uh, incidentally uh, this is something that just came to my mind and you're asking good questions when we were out to sea uh, an unusual incident happened there was they found out that there were a lot of oranges stored aboard ship you know in a brig down below so some of the men took it upon themselves to get down and help themselves to cases of oranges. And then the, uh, one of the officers aboard ship from the Navy started chasing them, and they dropped the crates and knocked him down the stairs into the brig. And the next thing we heard aboard ship, and this is the first time I bring this up in a long time, is here it is, here it is, attention, here it is, here it is. 
everyone is restricted to the ship. No one is allowed to leave the ship. Well, where the hell are we going to go? There's nowhere to go anyway. You're down to about 70 ships out there zigzagging, but uh, we were reprimanded for that, you know. Well, it's they, a good try. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. an unusual thing that happened there. Yeah, restricted to the ship, yeah. Yeah, everybody's restricted to the ship. So then England, it's, you probably land in um, J January or February? In January. So the weather must have been a little wet or... Well, the weather there is never good, even <laughs> at good times. But, uh, you know, it, it, it's... Uh, but you adjusted to the food or... Uh, well, the food was... Still army? We were not allowed to eat civilian food because of rationing. It was a real no-no. Uh, Quite restricted to, you know, some some families. Uh, Bruce's Rob, Bruce Robertson's uh, group there. He had a few friends with him. They met someone that owned a, uh, you know, a store that sold, uh, you know, like groceries and meats and things like that. They, I know they were invited over to their homes when they get a leave, and they would have dinner, eat with them, you know, have a dinner with them. But uh, I myself uh, never in, really indulged in it. I didn't care for the English food anyway. But the, the, the army food, eat all you want, but eat it. You know, don't leave it on your plate. So when you land in, um, in Weymouth then, you go through more training, different type of training? Oh, yeah. Yeah, once, once we got to Weymouth, that's where the uh, real training uh, all begins. Uh, first, I'll uh, just say that uh, we were uh, practicing with the use of live ammunition and everything that we did. And that started around March. Uh, prior to that time, when we would lay mines in the field for practice, it would be defused. Uh, we, we, we used blanks in the rifles during maneuvers. But from March on, it was all, March of 44, everything was live. But then we had one terrible incident happen, and I happened to get involved on it. And that was we had a, uh, a mine, a mine laying exercise. And the way mines are laid is you have a six by six truck basically loaded with uh, tank mines and they are about 12 inches in diameter and about two and a half inches or so in height. And uh, there is a cover on them that's like a ring and the fuse is in the center. And then if the ring is tipped, they'll explode. And there's a terrible blast that happens. Uh, the, there are two people on the back of the truck with the mines, hand the mines out to the soldiers that are laying them in a certain sequence. The sad part about it, and I didn't like the part when I first saw it anyway, but that was their practice. The truck driver would do the opposite in picking them up. He put the truck in reverse, try and follow the same trail, reverse, and, and yeah. they would pick the mines up, hand it to the man on the truck, and they would pile them up. Well, this time it didn't work because uh, one of the mines was hit. And uh, there, I, I, I can stop and think, uh, you know, for a moment. But uh, it was in the local paper in England, uh, the Stars and Stripes and things like that. We lost 29 men oh, that were killed and eight that were injured. And then our job, being in Company B, we were assigned to pick up the pieces. Oh. And I can honestly say to you that what we had was sacks, uh, like broom handles, and a nail at the end to just pick up the pieces all through the field. We had even parts of our of their shoes with the uh, shoelaces still in them, blown up, hanging from the trees. Terrible, terrible thing. But what happened then, the live ammunition order was lifted. They weren't going to do this anymore. You, you know, you lose too many men, you know, in these practices. And that was, and then the crater there was the size of a big, big 
bomb going off like uh, at the 9-11 thing, possibly in uh, New York. You know, terrible. I can just say that if a cat's supposed to have nine lives, I've had that. I've had far more. I can tell you that, and that that's truthful. After uh, that, about April the fifteenth, we started a big exercise called Tiger Exercising, and uh, that was an um, unbelievable operation. What happened was uh, we were being trained to land. We didn't know exactly where, but uh, there was an area in England that was set up as slapped in sands, S-L-A-P-T-O-N, slapped in sands. And in that area, uh, we erected or built a two and a half mile defense area to scale, showing the uh, German emplacements, fortifications that were in the area that we were supposed to invade in Normandy. Uh, this was a wonderful, uh, if you're looking for words, but it was a real realistic uh, to scale a building from air, you know, recognizance. It showed the pillboxes, it showed the, the roads, it showed uh, the uh, minefields, and even the highway signs, you know, on the roads, because this is very, very important. I, re I didn't never really realize how important it is to know where the hell you're going, you know, because you know, if you don't know where you're going, you're in real, real big trouble. But uh, the main road that we were heading for was at N13 when we got to our destination. But it showed all of this, you know, laid out to scale, and then the exercise, which was called Tiger Exercise, was being, in, uh, you know, uh, uh, started on and around April the 27th. And uh, what we did is we went by motorcade, a convoy, to witness the initial ass assault operation. Uh, we were going to storm the simulated German defense area. Uh, as I said, on the, it was called Slap and Sands, which, which was the exact uh, region. Uh, the operation, they told us, was going to show us some secret weapons and things. And I was really looking forward to seeing what was so secret, you know. But we watched this. And uh, it, it began with an hour barrage of shelling by U.S. destroyers, followed by the secret weapon I just mentioned to you, which was a huge, massive volley rocket launcher, you know, shelling out uh, rockets all over the beach. And then uh, there was uh, follow-up by aircraft, bombardment, you know, uh, firing. Uh, and then uh, when all of this was uh, completed uh, on the obstacles that were there, uh, the LCIs and the LCTs, landing craft infantry and tank, started to assault the beach. But there was only one big problem with that one. And it's factual, documented. German torpedo boats on the other side of the channel spotted this. And th they approached this training area. And they actually sank a number of our ships leaving approximately 700 dead, and then they sped back to France. Uh, this, this was actually witnessed by uh, our big brass, which included uh, Dwight David Eisenhower, uh, Omar Bradley, uh, Montgomery. It's just a few 
that sort of thing happen. Uh, uh, terrible, terrible. This is thing. April the 27th. This is April the, uh, yeah, April, it, it was actually April the 27th. This is only, this is within six weeks of the actual uh, invasion, isn't well, it? Well, no, uh, about, did you say six, six weeks? weeks? Yeah, yeah, six weeks, absolutely. That's amazing. Yeah, and so yeah, the, absolutely. So the planning, the planning was so uh, carried on to a, very precise, involved detail to think that they it, it recreated was, this, uh, this German military escape. This recreation and then was, uh, was so detailed yeah. that uh, it made you feel like you were back home on your street and you knew where home was or you knew yeah. where the store was or whatever. Yeah. Now, your, your, your unit didn't have to build anything in that. Oh, uh, yeah, we did. Yeah, that's what we were there yeah, for. We, yeah, there we, for. Were, we were there for building this in this uh, uh, tiger exercise. And then you viewed and, the tiger exercise. And then exercise. we viewed it, and this is what And it was so realistic, happened. the Germans yeah. showed up. They showed up with torpedo boats, and they sank a number of our ships. It's all on dock. You would think uh, the, the Germans would have, might have figured out what was going on. Well, they probably did. But they didn't make the connection. I don't know if they did or not, no, but I'll tell you something. Their yeah. airplanes were taking recon of our areas and if they didn't spot that, I sort of doubt it. I think they knew. Because sometimes when you hear about, maybe we're getting ahead, but when you read about um, D-Day, that the um, the Allies kind of faked the Germans out a little bit as to where the... Well, they did fake them out because uh, they had uh, a mock a setup at another area in Calais, I believe it was. And that was the shortest distance between the English coast and the French coast. Hitler was sold on that that's where they were going so to it hit. When it wasn't going to affect right. their, yeah. And yeah. Uh, to give you an idea, uh, they had 13 men selected uh, sometime in, I think it was the beginning of May. And uh, with one officer, uh, they asked for volunteers, but they knew who they were going to take anyway. And as I said, I don't believe in volunteering, really. I learned that lesson, but I did volunteer for this. And I wanted to join that group because I figured if you're going to go to London, that's a nice trip. Next thing is, you know, if you're going to learn something, that could be helpful for you in the future. But for some reason or other, the officer uh, in charge, didn't want me. He wanted me to stay where I was. You were already a, a sergeant. I was a sergeant, yeah. yeah. They, uh, uh, actually, uh, there, there was uh, one lieutenant, uh, one sergeant, and the rest were enlisted men. And they were selected to go to London. Uh, I felt kind of hurt, and I did talk to my captain about it, but he says, no, he says, we, we, just, we're making the decisions in here. And uh, what they were selected for, we didn't know beforehand, uh, they were going to approach uh, H hour, right there at the beginning, uh, as demolition men to assault the Utah Beach. Uh, incidentally, uh, I think it was Lieutenant Stafford and the rest of the men who I knew quite well, uh, they all made it. And uh, talking to them, uh, they said uh, it, it was nothing like they expected. You know, it went smooth. But uh, the trouble was not on the Utah Beach, as I'll mention later. Uh, the, the problem was with Omaha. And uh, so there's this ex there's this uh, incredible ex exercise. Yeah, this exercise. is incredible. Yeah. It is, it's, and then, now if you how long? How long before you know that it's going to be the D Day is the sixth of June? Well, all right. Uh, now I'm just going to, you know, I know you've done this before, Bruce. Uh, uh, Neil, I yeah. should say Neil. Yeah, yeah Neil O'Shea, but because uh, you know what you're asking. But let me just. Uh, oh, surely. Let me. Let, yeah. Let, let me just uh, tell please, you. Please, please. Yeah. We knew something was happening. Exactly when we didn't know, but about roughly mid-May, first, first part of May, yeah, first part of May, 
they took Weymouth, which was our town that we used to go in, you know, for uh, leaves of absence, you know, to, to go out on, uh, and visit, take off, go to town and have a few drinks, beers, meet some of the English girls that were looking forward because they knew we had money and, you know, and all of that kind of thing. They liked our uniforms. Anyway, the town started to balloon. It was absolutely like when when we arrived, going back to January, you could go down the street and the cars could be driving. You could take bicycles. You could do anything. But as the days went on, more and more soldiers came to town. Before you knew it, you were shoulder to shoulder. You were squeezed in. You couldn't even get in. And all of a sudden, one day, no one's there. Now, that's the first sign that you know something's going to happen. Well, let me just, you, you're on a good point in there, but uh, let me just uh, sure. explain to yeah, you please. what happened about that time. It was about the end of May, the first part of June. They took us by truck, six by sixes, to the marshalling areas. Now, marshalling area was along the coast of England, not far from where we were camped. The only thing is, uh, we were uh, uh, in, in a wired, like a cyclone wired, high fenced compound. You couldn't get in, you couldn't get out. It was guarded by the MPs. Now, you know, when you're going to tell someone they're going off to war, I'll tell you, they're not the happiest campers. Uh, I, I wasn't. I mean, uh, you know, you know you're going to, you know, you're training for this. The day's going to come. But someone is going to get not only hurt, they're going to get killed, see? So they were pretty smart. What they would do, beginning from that time on, They'd wake you up like a ridiculous hour. Oh, right. 1.45 in the morning. This is it. Put your clothes on. Pack your gear. We're going to go across the channel. So everybody's, you know, all worried and getting everything together to take you out to the boats. They put you on an LCI. The LCI goes out for 45 minutes or a half hour, returns back. Dry run. Okay. Wow. Boy, that makes you bitch. That oh, makes you oh, oh. Here I, I was fast asleep, and now that they, they got me on a boat, and then now they put me back in these compounds. They pulled us on you at ridiculous hours, you know, three, four times. Now you say, please do me a favor. Next time I get on that crazy ship, you make sure you take us to where we're going. Well, I'm, Good psychology, then. I, uh, it, it, I don't know who figured it out, but yeah. I can tell you, 99% uh, of the people aboard, they wanted to get off on the other side. You know, well, these uh, these dry runs, they work out. You know, uh, on the 6th of June, roughly, uh, we boarded an LCI and headed to our destination, Utah Beach. As darkness fell, we looked up and saw DC-4s, these are the airplanes carrying the paratroopers, gliders attached to these planes in tow, fighter planes escorting them, and then on the loudspeaker, and I, I, I did mark this down, it was basically it says, soldiers, sailors, airmen, you are to embark upon a great crusade towards which we have striven these many months. The eyes of the world are upon you, and I have great confidence in your courage, devotion to duty, and skill in battle. Dwight David Eisenhower. There's no turning back. This is it. But as dawn appeared, we could see the shore, the skyline, and there were approximately... 6,000 craft on the English Channel, boats of all sizes and shapes. This includes Higgins boats and everything. Uh, many of the vessels had, uh, I, there's another name for it, but large balloons, like uh, these balloons that are 
they're not as large as the blues are used for advertising today, Goodyear Tire or all of that, but they were tied by wire to the ships. And the reason for that was to keep the enemy aircraft from diving upon us while we were in the channel, because then, you know, they would smash up. Uh, they'd have to be like kamikaze, you know. Uh, the U.S. Texas was one of the large battleships, the destroyer, that was doing the shelling. And as I understand, they were using like 15-inch size, you know, uh, shells. Uh, that, that's three inches over a foot. That's pretty big, you know, in diameter. But we noticed something was wrong because as we were on the Higgins boat, and I did fire at something off on the shore, which I saw, which I, you know. You fired a? I fired my rifle from the Higgins boat. That was the I M1? That. Yeah, it was the M1. And, and in fact, I learned something very, very dear, and I didn't even make a note of it. I thought that going into battle, I want to get a bunch of tracers because this one I know where you're shooting. But the only thing I didn't know was the enemy knows where the, sh where the shells are coming from. And then, boom, they started getting fired back. So that wasn't too good of an idea. I did get rid of all my tracers. They're marked. Uh, I, I didn't want any more of those. Uh, the ropes on the LCI went down to side, the sides, and we went down onto the Higgin boats to take us into shore. Uh, something drastically, as I mentioned to you, was wrong. This can't be Utah. Utah is flat. We went through this exercise, two and a half miles, you know, of the darn thing, laid out the scale. These were cliffs that were going straight up like a wall. And there was shells, gunfire, hitting the water, and our soldiers were floating on the water, dead. Tanks, you know, sunk in the channel, trucks, all, all kinds of things. And it happened that they landed us on the wrong beach, which was the Omaha Beach. And as the sailor put the stick down into the water to see, you know, what the height of the water was, he pulled it up and he dropped the ramp, and off we went. And the first fellow that went off was this, one of the shortest guys that we had in the alpha, Tony Lamontia, probably five feet two. He disappeared, but then he bounced back up again, and, you know, he started going in uh, to shore. I would say that the water was probably, it was my chest height, which four and a half feet, five feet roughly, and our weapons were, you know, uh, wet, uh, being uh, M1, which is gas-fired, uh, operated, uh, couldn't use them because the chamber had to be dry. And uh, we wore stiff impregnated clothing, all of the assault troops wore. This was to, to, to uh, keep us from uh, getting burned uh, from uh, gas warfare so that uh, you know, our clothing underneath would be protected. And uh, when we did finally get to shore and we discarded them uh, later on, uh, they were so stiff you had to lay them down or they could stand up on their own. Now, when we hit the beach over there, the, the sight was absolutely gruesome. Here were soldiers. They were 20, 21, 25 years of age, primarily, lying one next to another with the blue and the gray emblem on their shoulder, the 29th Infantry Division. And all gone. They're, they weren't, they're not asleep, they're dead. And we had to literally crawl over them to get up along the ridges. While this was happening, the 2nd and 5th Ranger Division was still throwing grappling hooks onto the cliffs and scaling the cliffs while the Germans were firing down and they were dropping their potato mashers, grenades, mortars, fire, and everything else onto the beaches. Because on the beach, there was an alcove-like where a lot of the wounded were trying to protect themselves. But as the shells came down and exploded, it didn't help them 
you know, one iota. Uh, let me just uh, yeah. push the tape here. Those poor men who were dead, dead on the beach, yeah. that was because of rifle and machine gun fire, fire. from the emplacements on the, on the cliffs? That's correct. Yeah, or they were hit in the water and they made it to the beach and died. So they were, those poor fellows, they were in a previous wave? Oh, yeah. Now, there's a big mix-up on this whole thing that yeah. I'm uh, telling you because uh, even when I started thinking about this and, uh, you know, this lieutenant... Uh, uh, Colonel uh, Robertson was checking into this. Uh, when the 298 landed, there were supposed to be like four different echelons that landed at different times. Uh, the records are a little bit confusing, and it's you know hard to know exactly where you're at. It could have been that it was uh, when we saw those uh, aircraft overhead, paratroopers ready to jump at night, uh, the glider planes coming down, uh, landing and crashing, that could have been, the, be, they were there before us by maybe a day. Who the hell knows, really? Because y you don't have a calendar that you're looking at. Uh, but the only thing is, I can just tell you, we weren't far behind. It wasn't like the initial wave that came in on Utah at H hour. Uh, there was still firing going on, yeah. and, and the Rangers weren't there just but to it make was, a, a but demonstration. But it was, an, it was an absolute mistake that you were landed on Utah. Wasn't well, it that no, decided that they no, needed more people what, there, do you think? Yeah, you know what? I'll tell you something, Neil. You're absolutely right, because the further I started checking into this, they said that it was a possible uh, correction by the military to take the people that were headed for Utah, bring them to Omaha because the big losses that they were taking, and they were even contemplating stopping that part of the invasion at Omaha Beach. I can tell you, when I got up to the top of the cliffs, I actually had within a day a chance to look at their trenches. Their trenches that they had at their fortifications, leading in and out of the fortifications, were built way ahead of time. They had the sides covered with wood, so there wouldn't be any cadence. They were able to take horses that they were you know, using to get into the fortresses and get out through these trenches. They had a step up where it, it, in a regular foxhole, you're in there maybe five foot. You know, the, the, the less you have to dig, the better. But these were like seven foot. You could step up so you could look out and come back down again and duck down again. Uh, th these were amazing. Uh, they had gr they didn't need any maps as to where to shoot. It was just random shooting. They they used up all the ammunition they probably they possibly could use, and they would just go from one end to the other end and keep spraying the areas, you know, with gunfire. It was real hell. It was really, really rough. But as you just mentioned a moment ago, uh, it pos it's very, very possible that we came there because the, the first division was there, the Big Red, the number one, and the 29th, and they were in need of help. In fact, what happened when I got up to the top and we got ourselves pretty well organized to where we got rid of the, our uh, impregnated clothing, uh, we even threw away the gas mask, which uh, there was a, it's a mistake because about four or five days later they, they asked they, 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 no they they said air ga uh, they're a gas uh, oh. pack and then what are you going to do? You don't even have them, but we dumped them, and that was a false you know uh, attack. And uh, I went up to a captain there, and I, I asked him from the 29th, I says, Captain, you know, we're, we're, we're not supposed to really be here. <laughs> he says, well, he says, you know how to use a rifle? I says, yeah, I happen to be a sharpshooter. He says, well, then we can use you and your men. Just stay with us. Who you with? 298. Well, you'll meet up with the 298 down the line, 
he says, when you get to around Carentan. And he was absolutely right, and that's what happened. And that captain was in? He was with the 29th uh, Infantry Division. 29th Infantry Yeah, yeah. So that's where we, we stuck with him. And he says, if you can use your rifle, he says, we can use you. Uh, in about a week later, we did meet up, you know, with the uh, 298. And as we entered St. Maria Gleese, did you ever hear that uh, episode on St. Maria Gleese in France? That's the town that had the steeple, People. the church. They had the big Here. movie out, The Longest Day or whatever the hell yeah. it was with uh, uh, this. Uh, Red, Buttons was, Red Buttons, Buttons was the Red Buttons was the guy. Yeah, yeah. yeah you're good. Um, we entered that town, and that was uh, along that route M13. And to keep us horrified, they had a paratrooper hung on every telephone pole in the town going towards the church. None failed. Everyone had one of our boys that jumped. The glider planes, of course, crashed, and they were up against trees and everything else, but the guys hopefully made it out and whatever. But that shows the first sign of the brutalness of the Nazi yeah. uh, forces. And then what happened was they were, uh, there was a very narrow street, but as they were firing at us, we were on both sides of the streets. You know, we had men on the right, men on the left. And they couldn't figure out where, you know, they were getting their directions for their, uh, for, for their uh, weapons to fire at us. And they found there was a priest in the, ch in, in, the ch in the steeple. And they shot him down. And uh, that cut some of that down. Uh, so, so the priest was helping the Germans. Wasn't oh yeah, yeah. He was. Uh, yeah, it, it was like I said. It was a terrible sight uh, to see these uh, paratroopers uh, hanging on all of the uh, telephone poles. And uh, then, uh, then something. You know, the hedgerow country. Uh, just about that's right. Exact. About that time, I got my first Luger, and uh, I gave it to my son. Michael, who lives in Skokie, and he has it now. Is it a good weapon? Wonderful weapon. Uh, in fact, the numbers are on, on, on there are 8868. That's the Luger number. And the way I got that weapon was uh, we were in a hedgerow country, and someone, Bruce or someone, hit a German officer with the flamethrower. The German men came up, the soldiers, and they booby trapped him. Now he had a spurt to that flame on him. And I called for my six by six and we took the winch out. I pulled the winch between the hedges, came up to the officer, and I put the winch hook onto his belt, went back to the hedges through the hedges to the truck, and I says, pull him in. Well, he blew up immediately because they had him booby-trapped. I went back in there, and I got his binoculars and his, uh, you know, a Luger. The Luger itself was in excellent mint condition. I still have it. The two clips, the, everything goes with it. The holster was damaged. It had damage to it, but that's the way it is today. If the holster is damaged, the Luger is perfect. Binoculars, the glass was shattered, but I just took them along. I don't even think I even have the glasses anymore. Just dump them, take up room as you move. But uh, that was the story on my first uh, trophy. Uh, incidentally, talk, you know, I, I was accused of, uh, you know, uh, going after souvenirs, you know, and that's a no-no. But uh, when we were at that dump, it's amazing what you can do. I took a rifle out of that dump the first day in that uh, dump. This is the ammunition yeah, dump. German, the ammunition, German ammunition dump which in Bar Fleur. In Bar Fleur, which in you had to clear. Yeah. yeah. And I came back, and I had a Mauser that was in Cosmoline. It was covered, you know, with protective 
Greece. A Mauser is a, a rifle. Another, a rifle. Yeah, a wonderful piece of another a good weapon. weapon. Very, very good weapon. Uh, I took that gun, broke it apart, you know, disassembled it, put it in a box, and I said to one of the officers, "I'd like to send this home." And as long as he put his signature on there, I hope my son has that one too. I happen to have a sniper's one that I picked up during the war, and uh, that one, I, it's the only weapon I really have uh, of, that's any value. Is the sniper weapon a Mauser also? Or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a special gun. Uh, the uh, the sniper gun, I know uh, how I got it, but it, this, what's special about it is it's not a 30 caliber. It's a 22 long rifle. Beautiful. Longer range then? Or? Oh, yeah. It has a sniper uh, sight on it and everything. And someone was in a tree, and I, after they fell out of the tree, I picked it up. So uh, that one I took home. So did you do any long range marksmanship, would you say, when you're going in these? You made use of your own rifle skills yeah. while you're. Yeah. 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 Well, I, I, was, I, I was blessed with. Uh, you know, there's only four positions, prone, which you almost never miss, that's when you're laying down, sitting position, which you seldom use, kneeling, and, you know, being up erect. And that's the hardest, because you got to keep that sight and let it go where it's supposed to go. And they are accurate. I, I learned a few things in combat the first few nights. Uh, incidentally, the first few nights in combat were like the 4th of July all over again. Every night, every night it was the fourth, except these things that were coming down on you were real. And it lit up the sky like crazy. And you got to get used to this stuff because you can't worry about it. I, I, I'll tell you, my wife does not understand me because I'm too dumb to really worry. If you don't see anything wrong, if everything is quiet, Nothing is happening or you're dead. If you can hear it and it's all noisy and everything else, you're still alive. So what the hell, what do you, what, what's there to worry about? That was my, my theory. Yeah. All my days of my life. Oh, I, I got to tell you just one interesting thing that came up. I didn't want to really miss this. After the invasion, first few nights we were out there with the 29th Division. I was out with my squad in the field and I heard a bomber. And I could tell it was German. See, you can tell us by the sound of the engine. Um, 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 um. Your squad is about 15 but, men? You're no, 12. 12, yeah. And uh, I heard the bombs drop. And when you hear them squealing, you can tell just about what direction they're going in. You know if it's going to be a complete miss, near miss, or if it's in your back. Look out, yeah. Well, I told these guys, this is it. You know, on your knees, on your elbows, just breathe in and be prepared because I says, this is uh, going to really get us. They came in within about, I would say, a hundred and some yards away from us. And we're, 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 we're on our knees and elbows, waiting, waiting, waiting. No blast, nothing happening. Morning comes, bomb disposal comes out. They take out the fuses. And there's a note in each of those bombs. One was, I know one was a 2,000 pound and the other a 500. Compliments to the French underground. As they loaded them on the plane, they did not put the fuses in. Thank God. Viva la France. <laughs> Viva la France. I'm telling you, I'm telling you. So help me, Lord. That's one of those lives you mentioned. Yeah, that's one, that's one of those lives for sure. Yeah. Uh, The only other, uh, you know, it's good that the war was over within about 11 months. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. 
from June to May 45 uh, after, uh, yeah, yeah, from yeah. June to 6 to May to 7th, roughly, or you know, so. Uh, there was a couple other incidences, and one shows the real, real brutality, and then I got a follow up on that one. We were around Antwerp, Belgium, and the Battle of the Bulge started. And later on, you know, they try to get our general from the either 101st or 82nd to, re to surrender. McCulloch? McC yeah, McCulloch. Yeah. And he answered with one word, nuts, you know. Well, we happened to be near the town of Normandy. Oh. Well, I'll tell you something. That was a town that was surrounded by tiger tanks, all kind of German weaponry. They had, they, they had some colonel, a uh, German colonel in there, lieutenant colonel. His name was Slocum or uh, Joachim or something. I don't know what his last name was. But he he's written up in some of the journals, you know, that we, we saw. And he was vicious. Uh, they captured hundreds of American soldiers. And I'm a witness to the fact that what they did is they made them remove their uniforms, they slaughtered them, left them in the snow, and they took their uniforms and put them on and took our, a lot of our equipment, jeeps, any other vehicle they could have. In fact, you know, you have to be careful even in the field when you see airplanes coming down, like a P-51 will approach you, and you think, wow, who the hell's in that flying that plane? Because he looks like he's going after you. And then he'll flap his wings, you know, and give you wag, the, yeah. Yeah, wag, give you the high sign, you know. But, you know, it, 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 can, uh, it, it can really get to you. We would have the passwords. We would, uh, you know, try and ask. Uh, but uh, that, that killing was, there, 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 there's no words you can describe how ruthless, terrible that is. That, that, that gives you a sign when you hear about these concentration camps that I never ran across, thank God, of what they could have been, yeah. you know, like. Uh, we, had a, we had a funny incident happen uh, around uh, April, May of uh, 44. We captured a bunch because, you know, the engineers build these prison compounds, you know, enclosures. And we had a bunch of prisoners were captured. I was in charge of taking them to the camp. And when we got to the camp, I noticed on this one truck, there was a German high-ranking officer. And I, I, I like to collect things, you know, like you capture them, you take a ring, you know, a couple of, you know, uh, medals or decorations or whatever. This guy had to be four by four. I mean, he was short and he was bigger than any pig I ever saw. And he had some skull head on him, SS. And I said, I got to get this guy. So before he opened up the camp, I aimed my M1 at him. I had my Luger, but they couldn't see my Luger because, see, my Luger was in a special made holster they had made in France, and it was for a side holster or, you know, one that was under your jacket. And I aimed it at him. I says, arouse. He was surrounded by about a dozen of the other troops. You couldn't put your hand on him. If you killed him, you'd have to kill all of them. That's how rough it was. In other words, I decided, stay away. You know what I mean? The uniform isn't worth it. The decorations aren't worth it. And, you know, things like that. And that was the end of it. You were going to... I couldn't shoot him. No, but you were going to get his medals or something? Oh, I, yeah, I wanted that hat. I wanted uh, that hat and I wanted the, the jacket. I wanted, I'd like to just have him take his pants off and let him there, you know, Yeah. Uh, without anything on. Yeah. But, uh, can't do that. Yeah. 
Now, the main thing is, like I say, I was glad to get home. I got home on Thanksgiving Day of uh, 45. And I'll tell you, the Army was so swift at Camp Grant, they didn't want to give me dinner. But I insisted I get my turkey dinner because I was hungry and I, I, wanted, I wanted to be fed. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Kolkis, the, um I think we mentioned this in our preliminary discussions. Um, during your, um, in Normandy, yeah. you were wounded there. Yeah. Did, I, I don't know if we mentioned that on the tape. How did that happen? Well, okay, uh, if I forgot that, I forgot a big part of this. Okay, it was on the 27th of June in the Bar Flur area. We were just through uh, clearing that ammunition dump, the German dump. Oh, yes. I got the, the rifle the day before and all that thing. And we were coming back towards our campsite. As we were coming back, uh, there was like a construction hut. It appears to me like, you know, today when, you, when you're putting up buildings, you have like a trailer. This, yes. hut, this one single story reminded me of a construction trailer. It had windows, it had a door, it had railings, it had several steps going on, uh, you know, uh, to the door, up to the door. But the thing that made me leery of it, because I had already passed it, you know, was uh, it had all clean white gravel leading, you know, to the stairs. And then I heard this uh, one man talk to Jim Foster, hollering at him, and he was saying, Bosch, Bosch, meaning German. And Jim was sort of hepped up on it. And he took a dash for that house, which had the windows closed and everything, curtains down. And as he approached this gravel, he stepped on an S-mine. That S-mine just killed him instantly. I, incidentally, I went back to his family in uh, Ephraim, Wisconsin. I told him that uh, he was killed instantly and that there was no suffering or anything because there was nothing he could do. The priest uh, was there at his side. At, at his side. The uh, medics were there. Incidentally, that priest was from the Humboldt Park area. Now, that's really something. And he was wounded also, not in this incident, but he was wounded. He was in the uh, evacuation center when I was in there. Uh, Father Al, I believe it was, from the St. Fidelis Church on Hearst Street in Chicago, around Hearst and Washington. And I spoke to him. He remembered me, you know, one of the fellows in the neighborhood. But uh, th that killed Jim and uh, wounded five of us. And that's when I went back to the 28 General Hospital. And then they sent you back to England? Yeah, uh, then, yeah went back to England. Incidentally, going back to England, that was a terrible thing that happened, too. Uh, a lot of uh, U.S. troops were coming in, you know, to Normandy. And uh, we were on a hospital ship. Now, a hospital ship is nothing to talk about because it's terrible. They they, they have you tagged. The doctor tags you by your condition. The ones that are gone, they stack up like firewood on the deck, you know, five high, five stacks high, whatever. The ones that are about to, they're terrible, terrible shape, they're fed with morphine. The ones like myself that they can help, they're bandaged up and you're on your way. Just as we were leaving the Normandy area, a ship of troops came in. They had mines still out there in the water, and the mines are about two foot diameter, round, like balls. And they have these feelers on them, on the sides, the top. And when they hit something and they explode, that's it, baby. You know, they hit one of those ships. We lowered mattresses down to pick them up 
to bring him up to the ship so we could take him back to England. And the, the medical corps was busier in hell picking up the dead and the wounded that hit the mine just as we were leaving. So that was another terrible thing. And the sight when you come back to England of seeing all of those dabbed olive green, I thought of that word, you know, ambulances waiting, like an endless, yeah. you know, roll coming to pick you up, taking four at a time in or more or less. No. So you made a, you, you recovered then in England? Yeah. Yeah, I recovered in England. Did you have American nurses or English nurses? Or? Oh, no, we had American, and uh, we were in a big hospital, treated very, very, very well. Where was that? Uh, 28 General Hospital, wherever it was located. Okay. You know, I don't have the name of the town. I, you asked me that question actually once before. Oh, sorry. No, that's all right, but I couldn't remember then. I yeah. can't remember now, you know, yeah. where it was. And then, um, then after a couple, three months, then you're, they send you back? Yeah, I came back to Europe. And at that time, you, you again go by boat, but this time you land. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You, did you ever hear this from anybody else? No. You must have. No, no. You must have. Anyway, coming back, what a difference. Instead of being dropped off in the water, <laughs> you're... Progress. You're, you're, boy, I mean, you're, you're put on... You, you pull up to a dock where you had to go through with your rifle above your head. You, you're... You're on a landing. You walk in. Right, right onto the, you know, uh, on the earth. Right, at, you forget the beach. The beach is down below. Yeah. Amazing. And was that in Antwerp you came in? No. Uh, no, 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 no. That was came back to the same basic area. Normandy uh, again. Normandy again. Yeah. Only this yeah. time. Yeah. Yeah. No, Normandy again. Yeah. Yeah. So did you? Did you have to use your rifle again then when you got back to Europe? Oh, yeah. You were, you were still yeah. back in the... Yeah, incidentally, on those rifles, see what you do is I thought that, you know, uh, being a, a real good marksman, really, quite steady-handed, one of the things you want to peer through is your sight. You know, the sights are black. And they're black. Uh, what, what would you say... Uh, flat black. Well, I thought I'd polish them up, and then when I looked through the sight, I could see where that thing is aiming at. They could see too. It's like the tracers. Yeah. Many a nights, carbon to cover them, you know, because yeah. you want to make sure it's not seen. So when you, when the um, do you rejoin your reg your unit then when you come back to not, Europe? Not exactly. No. no, I was discharged. I came in with the 298, and I was discharged with the 298. Uh, I did other tasks that uh, I don't want to bring up at this session. Sure. You know, uh, like retraining uh, mm -hmm. personnel and things like that. But you you were in the drive to Germany then, were you? Oh yeah, yeah. oh yeah, yeah. We, I participated in all of the uh, in all of the campaigns. I missed none. With your nine. Nine lives, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, over nine lives. So, um, when you came back, then did you, uh, you 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 made use of the GI Bill? Yeah, when I returned home, uh, I uh, went back to school. First thing was to go back and complete uh, Crane Tech, get the high school diploma, which is basic. Then I went to Wright Junior College, and then uh, I went on to. Uh, industrial engineering studies and I got uh, my first job was uh, actually as an industrial engineer with the Euro Manufacturing Company. I ran a plant here in Chicago and uh, in uh, St. Louis, Missouri that they were you know breaking down. Then when I was getting married, you know thinking about getting married, you know people do that, you know. Uh, I uh, figured I didn't want to travel or, mm -hmm. you know. So I got a job with uh, Reuben H. Donnelly, and I, I, I lasted there for about 35 years. Was that in the plant downtown? or? Uh, uh, no, that was outside uh, Yellow Pages. You know, let the fingers do the walking. Yeah. Um, 
your wife, was she, did you know her before you went into service? Uh, okay, my wife, I didn't know before I went into the service. Uh, I knew a lot of other girls yeah. before going into the service. Strike that one. Uh, but, uh, no, I was married twice. I am married. My, this is my second marriage. I was married uh, after I got out of the service in 1953. Fifty. Oh, okay, it was a, yeah, a bit yeah. of time had yeah. passed. Oh yeah, because schooling and everything yeah. else. And so when you came back from the service, then you were pretty serious about. You didn't have a difficult time readjusting or making your way or, or, uh, or no, not. No, I, I I was pretty lucky. I, there was I room for you at home when you came home. Oh yeah, because my brother got married and uh -oh. you know right away, and my older brother got. In fact, he just passed down last May. He was 85, but uh, that made room for me. You know, at home, so I could share my bedroom with my other brother. My sister had her own room, but uh, yeah, I was serious about work, and I I know why I went into the engineers because I was always handy. See, even though you know I worked, you know, for Donnelly, I was very interested in construction all the time. In fact, I should have gone into construction, stayed in construction because I was brought up, I, you know, liking working with tools. Yeah. And that makes you relax. If you get a lot of tensions and things like that, you know, you start using your golden hands, you know, you start doing something creative. Yeah. Uh, did, did you, st you stayed in touch with some of your wartime buddies? Oh, after, yeah. yeah. Well, we had reunions and we, we kept in touch as much as you, uh, you know, can. Some of them were almost impossible to, to contact because of their condition and, you know, things like that. But we had reunions every two years. We, our reunions would be held in Michigan uh, or in the Chicagoland area. So you were a member of the VFW then? Or? Oh, yeah, I'm a lifetime member of lifetime VFW, member. yeah. Uh, I'm a member, 30-year, in fact, I have a 30-year pin coming from the Jewish War Veterans. Uh, I've been invited to join the, you know, American Legion. But, you know, how many organizations, yeah. you know, I'll tell you what makes it tough. As you get older, every, you know, and, and you've worked hard your whole life and you've saved and everything else. The way things are run today, as you know, you, you wonder why some people leave. If nothing else, they'll get you to tax as well. Yeah. yeah. No, really. Um, no matter how hard you work and all that, it's used up yeah. because of inflation, taxation. And inflation, I think you said. Yeah. Uh, you know, again, I think about it. It doesn't worry me. My wife is very concerned about it. I'll give you an example. We bought a home uh, eight years ago, and the taxes were $1,700 a year. The last tax bill was like 6600 And when you have two locations, because we both like, you know, to take it. A little easier and get away from the cold winters. Well, you're entitled to it, and yeah, well, yeah. And uh, we bought this place, you know, in Florida. And then I spoke before the legislature, and then they're going to do something about it. Now I understand they're going to reduce it a little bit, but we've got the place up for sale. The uh, the thing is, I really live day to day. Yeah. You know, I'm here today. I had the pleasure of meeting yourself. You know, Neil O'Shea. <laughs> Uh, Thank you. Tomorrow will be someone yeah. else. And here, uh, you could show you, when I first came into the place, I asked for you were there, and I wouldn't have known you from anyone else. Yeah. Mr. Kovitz, I have to ask you, how do you think your military service and experiences affected your life? That's a question we always ask as we're winding up. Well, uh, okay. Well, that's a good question. Let me think for a moment. Yeah. Right. I, myself, personally, have no regrets in having served in the military. Uh, up to the recent wars that followed, the Korean War, which I know nothing about, really, the Vietnam War, which I was working and know very little about, uh, the, these Gulf Wars, there's too many, too many, too many wars. Uh, people killing one another. For what? I mean, what's happened in the past 
administration, you know, with President George Bush, and I have really nothing against the parties or anything, but he has gotten us into a terrible, terrible jam. You can quote me on that. He's taken over 3,000 lives away from families. I don't know how many are wounded, and, you know, especially with this, uh, these uh, mines, the demolition devices that they're using. They have names for it, uh, you know, uh, you can't see them, but if they don't get you today, they're going to get you tomorrow. That's the same with working with demolition. Uh, everything you want today, as you grow older, The inflation is really terrible. I, I'll give you an example. I, I, I consider myself lucky, fortunately. I've got heart problems, but I've never had heart surgery. There's other few problems. But I'm here. I feel aches and pains, but I'm still able to get up and get around. Uh, we went to a doctor. You, go to, you know, you live long enough, your doctors leave you. They True. leave you because yeah. they died. Yeah. See, they, they, they serve you, and, they, and then they're gone. But now we're having another problem. I went to a doctor. It was a very fine young doctor just out of medical school. I, and I thought he was, and I think he's terrific even now. I have nothing against him. But all of a sudden, he decides that he wants to make more money. He's going to still stay as a doctor. He's not going into uh, carpentry or, you know, concrete work or anything. But now the only difference is, he joined a group, a VIP group. Max, if you want to come to me, I'm inviting you with open arms. Your wife is welcome as well. But now, for the two of you to see me, $3,000 up front at the Rush Presbyterian St. Luke's Hospital, or I can't operate. I can't see so many people, I have to limit my practice. I'm going to give you better service. I'll be on the phone to answer your calls whenever you call. I, I hope I live to see that from any doctor. You call them, they're on vacation, yeah. or they're busy, or whatever it is. Yeah. Or this taxation factor, or helping people in need. I'm fortunate. I'm insured. My medication is insured, and therefore my wife's medication. People can't afford it. Yeah. These necessities. There has to be change. Yeah. Especially for the and, 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 and these put our vets that, that are injured and Yeah. Uh, it's it, it just it's just awful. Yeah. And uh, you know, uh, for our future generation to take on the debt that is being created if it was used for more useful purposes, we'd all be way ahead. Yeah. Who the hell had to go in and and get ourselves involved in Iraq? Weapons of mass destructions, when they haven't proven any, well, they, they'll, they can bury them and, and they'll find them. You can do anything, you know, if you work hard enough at it. Yeah. Prices of fuel, I never cared when I had to go somewhere with my car. Hell, you get in the car, so what if I get 12 miles to gallon, you know, 15 miles to gallon. But now it becomes an issue. But now it's an issue. Yeah. Now when you're at the pump, it's over $3, three, three dollars a gallon. a gallon, yeah. You know, somebody's making money on this. Yeah. You know, you and when I got out of the service, as I mentioned to you, my parents needed a place to live. I never drank, I never smoked, no good. He had other vices, you know, but I saved as much as I could, and I was able to help them buy their home when I got out of the service, which is a three flat in Humble Park, for $7,000. A couple months ago, I'm photographing the area. I go by the house, 13, 14 Rockwell. I see they're rehabbing the house. I walk in. I introduce myself to the guys. I lived there 70 years ago. Well, we're talking about 63 years ago, what we just discussed, you know, on record. Yes. I says, can I go through that house? He says, sure. He takes me through, shows me where I used to sleep in the kitchen. And... Uh, 
I asked him before leaving, I said, you know, I, I'm always interested in construction and all this and that. Well, what did you happen to pay for this house? He says, I paid a half a million dollars. He says, I dug the basement out two feet and we put I-beams through there to mm -hmm. raise it so we can make a duplex out of this. I'll charge 500 and some thousand for that duplex. The other two apartments, I'm going to get 300,000 apiece. I think he's in dreamland. You know, but anyway, people can't afford all this. Stuff. Yeah, it, it's going to. It's crazy. You know, yeah, you, even now it come, seems that the, it's got to come down to reality. It seems like the bubble is sort of leaking a little bit right now, economically. No, it, it, it's been it's been real tough, and I don't worry about it, but like I say, others do. Yeah, Mr. Colgus, there's one. Um, um, treasured memory that you were kind enough to share with me, and I think it was before we actually began the interview, but as we moved toward the end, um, you showed me your dog tags here, and then attached to the, the dog tags is this... Um, yeah, that's a mezuzah. A religious artifact, a mezuzah. Yeah, a mezuzah. Yeah, I want to tell you, that's, uh, you know, when you enter into uh, generally a Jewish home, on the door, usually to the left, and uh, that would be part of the frame. Uh, you'll find a, an article of this, of, of, of larger type, fastened to the door. It's to protect you from danger. You know, it, it's a blessing for the family, you know, within. Uh, when I went into the service, uh, the synagogue that my parents belonged to sent this to me, you know, as a keepsake. And I attached it, you know, to my dog tags, figuring, you know, anything that helps is welcome, you know. And as I said to you, I noticed when I got out of the water and got up onto shore that that little oval capsule was missing. Well, the parchment that's in there I just didn't want it to leave, so I crimped it with my teeth, and I've had it ever since. Now, I haven't used this for many, many years, but I said, if I'm coming here to meet with you today, I think that would be something interesting, you know, to bring along with me. Yeah, it surely is, and uh, I'm very appreciative that you shared so much with us this afternoon. Well, it's my. Uh, see, you did your outline and yeah, related like, documents and yeah. the pictures. It's going to be a wonderful here? transcript yeah. when we get this all packaged. Well, I, yeah. I appreciate your help, and I'll, I'll, I, I should try and offer more help. I know that tomorrow there's a meeting in Niles on Thursday for the veteran group. Over, oh, Mr. Yeah. Friedman. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I go there. Uh, I've been coming to these, ex, you know, exchanging thoughts and things of that nature. And, you know, everyone has, you know, their differences of opinion. Uh, I'm not going to be here for, forever. I feel that the future generations should know what their forefathers went through. And I feel that this is a good thing to have for reference sake and from, for them to look at. Uh, a lot of these people today, and I've spoken to them, don't believe what has happened. I could sit here and tell you stories that are so help me true that you wouldn't believe. And it's all close to home, and they're true, but I just don't want to talk about them, you know. Well, you sh you shared it. I shared a lot, a lot with you. I shared a lot with you. That's a beautiful, you. beautiful shared, closing I, statement I, yeah, about no. the value of the project. Yeah, Thank I, you. No, I tell you, I, 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 uh, so maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm right. Maybe I'm wrong. But all is not known because of reason. But. Even being of the Jewish faith, and through circles, I can just mention to you that I have met
people and know them that have served not only under Hitler, but for Hitler in his headquarters. And, you know, this is almost unbelievable. And when it comes to certain details, no one wants to talk about it. But this is exactly how I found out what happened to my uncle, aunt, and their kids that lived in the same unit of housing by the flax factory in Rakishkis, Lithuania, because one of the officers that was involved in this thing, in the German army, back in the early 40s, I actually traced him to where he lived in the Chicago area. And when I reported him to the federal uh, uh, department, he had already left the states because he retired working for the railroad. And he took off for, for Europe with his wife. Uh, just missed him by a hair. Uh, followed him till he got to where he was. And he told me that his, when I asked him what his function was in the German army, his, he answered me that he knew, he, see, he, he knew my uncle and aunt and the kids. He was a mailman for the German forces, see, and he delivered mail to them. Now, could you believe talking to someone like that? Unbelievable. Unbelievable. What what could I do to him? I mean, you know, you, you do anything, yeah. you're in trouble. But well, he was German or Lithuanian, this man? The this, man man. Was, this man was German. He was German. Yeah, this man was German. I, like I say, I have a lot of friends of the German faith. I have nothing, you know, as I told you, you could be born of anything. Yeah. But uh, the, the things a person, if he lives long enough, but I... I learned this in my late 20s and 30s, you know, and it's been a long time. But, uh, That's amazing. No, this, this I'm is glad you uh, glad you called, and I'm uh, very grateful that you came in. Well, I'm I, I'm happy we'll, what you're doing. Yeah, and uh, we'll wind uh, it up. I think. Yeah. yeah. Uh, hopefully, we'll wind this up right now. And uh, if it's like any other help, I could be of service Thank you. to you. I think you're doing a great thing, and I hope these kids believe as, as yeah. to what has happened yeah. existed. Yeah. You know, and it's no fun. No. Uh, when you're called to serve, you serve. And I was glad to serve my country. I did what they asked, and that was it. Thank you, Mr. Kolkis. Thank you. I think it's a 41 Cadillac. And it's a uh, convertible. It's a... Uh, I've I've been attending show because it shows I have a classic car too that I Well what kind do you have? I have a, a old convertible. Yeah, there's only seven hundred of them. They were made seven hundred, it's less than a hundred around. It's an eighty four. It's in Florida now. But what kind of an old is it? A cutlass? Or? Cutlass Euro Brome. Yeah. It's worth about twenty thousand. Yeah. Good engines in those. Isn't it? <laughs> well it was till the Florida guys got a hold of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but it I had to have you rebuilt it. So we could. Okay, here. I'll just start off. I'll say, uh, and I also like to mention. Sure, you know, here we go. Uh, by the way. Okay. Yeah, yeah, we're all set. And by the way, uh, Mr. O'Shea, uh, I'd like to bring up uh, June the 12th of 1944. Uh, the 298 uh, combat engineers were finally intact. Our esteemed Colonel Leidick appeared with the co with the kitchen party. Uh, they were the last uh, echelon uh, to get to Normandy. Uh, I was in a foxhole near St. Uh, Marie du Mont, uh, close to, you know, Hubert, France, and noticed the German aircraft overhead, uh, way up in the sky. And it was a, a recon uh, airplane. You could tell by the engine, again, the engine sound, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, you know. And then uh, the Colonel ordered us out uh, of the foxholes uh, to remove some of the glider planes that uh, 
came in on D-Day uh, that were cluttering the field. Why? Who the hell knows? Uh, we don't stay one place anyway. We just go from one spot to the next. We move on. Uh, and then they told us to stay where we're at, information for a head count or a roll call. Approximately 11 o'clock in the evening, a German fighter plane attacked us. He dropped any personnel bombs on us, cut his engine, made a turnaround, and returned firing his 50 caliber machine gun on us. Five were killed, 25 were wounded. I got a clear view of him in the cockpit pit against the skyline. No return fire from us at all. In fact, I myself was surprised I didn't take a shot at him because he was so low and so close. But uh, that's where he goes. Wow. No, that's really something. Uh, this uh, German uh, pilot had a lot of Guts knew exactly what he was doing, and uh, I could, I, after he left and all the devastation behind, I could just remember, I could just think in my mind of the return that he received after he had all this, you know, on uh, tape, uh, on film. Or they, was, they, did he oh, they, they, they were taking pictures too, you know, and I'm sure this was all filmed. Uh, I can see him wearing that German uh, Iron Cross right now. But uh, I had a very, very clear view at him. Uh, and those planes were flying at about uh, roughly 300 miles an hour. And uh, could have been gotten. But now one shot was fired from any of us because of all the chaos. The shock and, 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 and what was happening in the area. And why the heck we had to monkey around with those gliders? Uh, is beyond me because they were all tail up, you know, every one of them. And uh, we just uh, move out of the area within hours. So uh, let whatever lies be there, you know. It, it really makes no sense to me. But that's a lieutenant colonel for you. Is that the esteemed lieutenant colonel? The esteemed lieutenant colonel Leidig, yeah, Colonel Leidig. Thank you, Mr. Colfus. Okay. We have our cassette tape recorder going, and we have our digital recorder going. And between the two of them, we should have one good sound recording of this interview. Uh, this Veterans History Project interview is being conducted on August the 15th, 2007, here at the Niles Public Library. My name is Neil O'Shea, and I'm speaking with Mr. Irvin C. Blazinski. Uh, Mr. Blazinski was born in Chicago, and he now lives here uh, in the community of Niles, and he has kindly consented to be interviewed for this project here at his local library. Um, Mr. Blazinski, may I refer to you? May I address you as Irv? Yes. Thank you. Um, so if we can turn back the hands of time, as it were. <laughs> Go back now. Um, when did you enter uh, the military service? In 42. In 42. Yeah. And did you enlist or were you drafted? No, I enlisted in the Coast Guard. And um, why did you choose the Coast Guard? Uh, well, I originally wanted to go into the Marines, but I wore glasses, and they wouldn't accept me. So they told me that the uh, the uh, Coast Guard was waving the glasses, so that's how I joined the Coast Guard. And had you worn glasses in school, and yeah. you, since you were young, yeah, much mm -hmm. younger. What what high school did you attend, if I may ask? DePaul Academy. Oh, the academy. Yeah. Yeah, down there in Sheffield and Belden. And Kenmore. And Kenmore, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. The, um, so were you living down in that uh, Link, North Lincoln Park neighborhood at that time? Not then? really. Uh, I I lived in, um, 
uh, Ashland and North Avenue. That's where I was born and raised. Yeah. Had any of your had anybody in your family served in the First World War? No. Not that I know of. Yeah. So a lot of your um, a lot of your friends, did they also enlist or Oh yes. There was quite a few. You didn't wait, you just enlisted, yeah. 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 Were you I think you mentioned that you were twenty years of age when you entered uh, the Coast Guard. Yeah. So you had been out of high school for a couple of years then, maybe, yeah, is that right? right? What were you doing uh, after high school? Uh, I was working in, in a factory, and I wasn't very happy with it, you know. And uh, I was glad to, to, to leave. <laughs> Did your did the people at home at your in in your house did did they think it was a good idea you were enlisting in the oh, service yes. did they yeah. mm -hmm. and you weren't worried or anything like that or no. fearful no I was worried that they wouldn't take me you wanted to get in there that's the attitude of the people at that time yeah and then um, where did you uh, did you have to go to Fort Sheridan, or where was the where no, you inducted? I I, um, I went downtown to the train station, and they took me to Manhattan, New, Manhattan, New York. Well, they called it Manhattan Beach. That was a training station for the Coast Guard. That's where I started. Yeah. The um, so was that the first time you had been outside the city of Chicago? I suppose, yes. That must have been pretty exciting, taking a train oh, yeah. to New York. Yeah, but you know how long that train took? No. We decided, like, oh, it was a, uh, well, it, it was a long ride, you know, because the, 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 all the uh, freight trains and everything were priority to us, you know. So it took a while. So in the... Uh, in the Coast Guard, do you go through some kind of basic training? Oh, yeah, basic, yeah. And, uh, and that was in New York or Manhattan Beach. Is that where right. the basic training yeah. was? I was so homesick. If you look at the date that I went in, I went in 12-17. Oh, so yeah. A week before Christmas. And, uh, in fact, I met, uh, I met my... Uh, friend in Manhattan Beach and I was so happy to see him and he says I'm shipping out today oh. <laughs> the first day so was that uh, a buddy from the old neighborhood or from school he lives right here the oh yeah, another, yeah another one mm. I, there's two two fellows that are uh, that uh, were in the Coast Guard that live here in Niles so basic training for the Coast Guard, is that done on a ship or is it done on land? On land. Well, first of all, uh, we went to uh, the firing range and uh, all of the, uh, right on the, on the base, you know. And then, uh, then I, uh, I was, they, they, wanna, they put us in a, in, a, in a private home in Sea Isle City, New Jersey. It's on the Atlantic coast, and we were doing guard duty. We were doing guard duty for the uh, for the uh, along the ocean, you know, because see they they picked up they picked up some people uh, from the German sub that were trying to get in our country at that time. So we had patrols day and night all along the Atlantic coast. So the basic training lasted probably, was it six weeks or eight yeah, weeks? Yeah, six weeks, but it wasn't much of anything. You know, you went for swimming classes for a couple of days, but it, it wasn't... Uh, so you, you, you probably could already swim. Yeah. You weren't afraid of the water. Yeah. 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 So... Would, would your... Would the, the fact that you wore glasses, would that have kept you out of the Navy, too, or not? Or could yes, uh, the, the Navy also didn't want anybody. 
So yes. there must have been a lot of people in the Coast Guard with glasses, weren't there? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but then, then they all eased up, and they all accepted with glasses, you know, mm. the Marines and everybody. So after this period of basic training in, in mm -hmm. around Sea Isle, New Jersey or yeah. wherever, did you get assigned to a unit or a ship or...? No, uh, no I, went, uh, I went to Sea Isle City. And then from there, we went to Norfolk, Virginia to form uh, crews for the, uh, for, uh, for the destroyer escorts that we were going to man. See, we we owned uh, we the Coast Guard didn't own any ships, uh, not that that type of ship. The uh, Navy owned them, and they we we manned 40 ships for the uh, for the Navy. You know, in other words, we it was all Coast Guard personnel on the ship. See, and it was a it was a Navy ship. But it was manned by a Coast Guard. I see. Officers and everything. And then uh, we went to, uh, to uh, we went to a lot of training in Norfolk while we were waiting for our ship to be built. It was being built in Galveston, Texas. And and then uh, after uh, our ship was ready, we. Uh, they formed the crew right there, you know, they, they put us all in and uh, sent us to Galveston and we boarded the ship. You boarded the ship in Galveston? Yeah. And then we started our, uh, what they call shakedown. That means that they put the ship through all kinds of uh, maneuvers and we, we went to Bermuda for that, you know. And uh, then we started our, uh, uh, I have that booklet that tells you where we started and, you know. Yeah, Mr. Uh, Lazinski is kindly uh, uh, giving us a copy of the history of the, the USS Rhodes. Yeah, see. Destroyer Escort 384, it, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. See, this was our skipper. And then... Uh, he was the next skipper, and then this was the last skipper. So you were the first crew on this new ship. Yeah, it was brand new. And did it have any things wrong with it, or was it okay from the beginning? Well, or? it was a little mix and mix, but nothing major, you know. So how big was the crew on, on the... Uh, uh, I think we had uh, a crew of something like 235 on there. So, so this ship carried uh, guns and... Oh, I, I, it was complete. Complete warship. We, <coughs> we went out, what they call for a shakedown, and we um, the, the shakedown was going through all the maneuvers of wartime. Yeah. See, and uh, after that, we then we started uh, escorting convoys across the ocean. When you were in Norfolk, were you in were you in staying and mixing with Navy personnel? Oh yeah. How did they? What did they think of you guys? Was there any friction Nothing. between Coast Guard and Navy? Not, no. No, not no problem. Before you um, went down to Galveston to get on the new ship, did you get a chance to come home or anything like that? No. 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 Straight out. The first time I came home, I can't even remember now. Yeah. Uh, they worked it out. Uh, between convoys that we could go home for 30 days. That, and I, I don't even, I mean, I'm, I'm poor at records. When, when this guy gave me this, all these records, I, I couldn't believe it. Yeah. So did you have a duty on the ship or a, a title oh, yeah. or a... Well, I started as a first class seaman and um, and then uh, I uh, then I was a jacket of dust. What a jacket of dust is is he took the food from the uh, hole and, and gave it to the kitchen, well, the galley. And uh, 
when, every day they give you an order what they needed, and that was my job. Jacket, dust. Yeah, jacket of dust. Jacket of dust. The yeah. dust. Or yeah. yeah, that's an interesting term. Yeah, <laughs> but you know, I never had, uh, I never had a problem getting help. Because everybody wanted to get down that hole to get some food. Yeah. <laughs> when you when you joined the coast the Coast Guard, did you think you'd wind up serving like a Navy person out at sea with convoys? Did you think? Oh that, yeah. Oh, you knew that uh, was I was. I uh, that's what was my idea. Yeah. So, you're uh, you join up in uh, December of forty two. Yeah. And then when do you go out to sea then? Uh, go. Well, uh, you know, I, I don't really have, uh, see the, let's see, uh, see it was launched in uh, 40, June of 43, and uh, and commissioned the same city on October 20th so, as a product of the uh, pro a product of the Brown Shipping Company. Yeah. So you probably had uh, like 10 or 11 months to get ready oh, between yeah. the training and oh, the yeah. Well, yeah, it didn't go overnight. <laughs> yeah, it didn't know. go overnight. No. During the trips, while well, I'm trying to see if they put down. Uh, If they put down when we made our first trip. So the first trip, you were probably escorting um, ships. Yeah, yes. supply yeah, those ships. Those pictures of all those ships. There was airplanes on there and everything on those ships. And where were the? Where were they all going? Uh, how many you think there were on there? One of those convoys, 150, 200 ships. Wow! Wow! And we were we were escorting them, and we were on the outside, protecting them from submarines. That's the whole thing. And and you were heading for, at that time, yeah, uh, England. Yeah, the, the first one was Casablanca, wow. North Africa. Cool. Yeah, and when we got there, there was six inches of diesel oil on it because they just they just. Uh, bombarded the uh, Germans and chased them out of Casablanca, and there was sunken ships all over the place when we got in there. Did you have any shore leave when you were in Casablanca? Oh yeah, yeah, we went to shore. That must have been interesting. Yeah, and how? <laughs> it was a different kind of life. I bet. And it was more, you know, it was a. a it was very, um, poverty was very, uh, how would I say it? Uh, Evident or? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, wherever we went, we went ashore, yeah. you know. But the food was pretty good on the ship. Oh, yeah. You didn't lose any weight when you went in the Coast Guard, did you? Some they, guys? Well, they didn't have K rations on our ship. You ate well. <laughs> yeah. That was the best thing. I tell you, if I, uh, it was up to me, if my children wanted to go in the service, I'd tell them, go in the Navy. It was so much better, you know. Yeah. yeah. The, um, so on that first, on that convoy to, to Casablanca, were there any, uh, did the Germans threaten you at no, all? No, no. Not, not that one. But there was one when we went through the... Uh, Mediterranean that were, we were attacked by German planes, and, but they knew that they were coming, you know, because we knew the intelligence told us. And then where did you where did you dock in the Mediterranean? Then uh, did you have to? Uh, uh, we went. In, well, let me see here. You know, this is 50 years ago. You know, and <laughs> turning back the hands of time. Oh, this is, uh, yeah. See, we, according to this, uh, we went to um, 
we went to New York, uh, escorted a New York section of the Norfolk. Oh, we had four anti-submarine attacks on that uh, tour. You know, I mean that uh, when we were taking those ships across. You know, we were called, you know, we're more like a, a killer group. We we just about wiped out the, the uh, submarine, not our ship, but there was 400 that were built for for submarine warfare. See, the, the, the destroyer escort was designed to fight the submarine. Ah, and there were 400 of, of those ships built. Yeah, there was 400 of them. And uh, the Navy had the most of them, and we had 40 of them. 40? Yeah. It looks like you might have landed in Tunisia. Huh? It looks like you might have landed in Tunisia. This that is be? Bizerti here. Yeah. And Tunisia. Yeah. That's, that's right down the coast. Right, right yeah. down the coast. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, well, that must have been you, If you read all these here, you'll see. Yeah. That must have been another interesting place to come to stop uh, Tunisia. Huh? That must have been interesting also, oh, all these yeah. places. It, it was unreal, you know. <laughs> I'll tell you a story. We were going into town, and I, I don't remember, who, because we went to Africa a couple of times, you know. So, And um, we were, were wanting to go into town, so we went on, a, on the highway, and we were hitching a ride, and... Uh, <laughs> A big truck, like an army truck, you know, with uh, personnel on there in the back, you know, and and these were all these big. Um, they they were black, but they weren't considered black. They were uh, from Africa. These guys were twice our size, you know, and and they were so gentle to us. It wasn't funny. <laughs> So uh, if you if you read all this here, you'll get a good idea. Yeah, I think that would be very helpful if we add that chronology to the uh, to your remarks. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then I see that you might have even gone up to Ireland, did you? you oh yeah, Northern we Ireland. You know what happened? We went to Ireland. We escorted a a, 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 a aircraft carrier. And uh, actually, we were going to Wales. Oh yes. And and uh, the right at the buoy, there was a submarine sitting there. And when we, uh, our orders were just to bring it to the buoy and then go go back to where we were coming from. And uh, it, a tor it tor it hit uh, a torpedo hit it from that submarine. But uh, I don't know what happened because we, we our orders were not to go back, you know. The so the torpedo hit the aircraft carrier. Yeah. Oh. And they said, don't worry, there was and there was no damage, you know. So the, the aircraft carrier went into Wales. I'd have to read this whole thing to remind myself of all this, you know. But you were you, everywhere. You, you, know, you were everywhere. Yeah. Oh yeah, you were up in London, Derry. Yeah. Yeah. You probably that's oh, uh, that beautiful there. Oh, you know, you, you you know it was in the middle of winter and you pulled alongside and and I don't remember, but the whole side of the mountain was green, and the other side was snow. <laughs> yeah, this thing tells a lot of stories. Yeah, it's, it's very it's jam packed with uh, with details. You know, this, and you were in all these places. That's amazing. Did you ever any? Did you ever get seasick? Did you have any trouble adjusting to? Well, a little bit woozy, you know, and that. But there were some people that they had to take off the ship. That's how bad they were. As soon as they, as soon as they say, lift the anchor, 
These guys would be sick as the dogs. Yeah. They were fine when we were in port. <laughs> <laughs> and then, if they, if you got the word that there was a German plane or something, did did everybody have to everybody, get a gun or something? Everybody or? turns to uh, with the uh, um, with the uh, guns. You know, like I was on the. Uh, I'm, 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 See if I got a picture here. Uh, I was on the number two gun. The number two gun. Mm -hmm. That was in. I, I should give you a better picture of our ship, you know. Yeah, we'll have to get a, a picture of the of the See, roads this, for this the one here, for the transcript. This is transferring a doctor from one ship to another. In a, you know. Uh, on a buoy, you know, do uh, you, you ever see one of these buoys? They Not cross like a that. line and cross. Oh right, yeah. yeah. Oh right. This was at sea. Yeah, it'd be hard to transfer personnel at sea from one ship to another, right? right? So the easy, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. See, nobody uh, labeled these pictures, and I have no idea. Yeah. You know. I have a nice picture of our ship. I, 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 I'll give it to you. Yeah, we'll make a copy of it. Mm -hmm. I didn't bring one with me. But you, uh, when uh, you say you're going to be gone for a week? Yeah. Okay, then I, in the meantime, I'll be working on it. Okay. And then I'll call you. Thank you. So did you? It says the crew was granted liberty in Londonderry, Northern Ireland. Did you? Did you go ashore then in oh, Derry? Yeah. yeah. Did you enjoy? So you enjoyed yeah, that? The, we had the fish and chips. Yeah. You, you know, people were walking down the street eating fish and chips. Yeah. You know, it's just like a McDonald's here. Yeah. You know, but everybody, oh, their 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 potatoes are great. You know, it's, I don't know why they are so famous. I guess it must be the soil. Mm -hmm. Yeah, lovely dairy on the banks of the foil. Yeah, and then you mentioned that it's uh, in here. It, it was a terrible, uh, full gale winds and tremendous seas. Were you, were you frightened then? Oh yeah, because the the uh, the swells of the ocean were going over the ship, and we didn't. And, we were in the English Channel, and we didn't think we were going to get out of it. That's how bad it was. I'm I'm surprised that the ships didn't break in half. You know that that ocean was so bad. So then, it as things are winding down in Europe, um, you head back toward the United States, right? Yeah. But then you got another half the world to go to, right? Because yeah, then you we go. Went, uh, we went. Um, to, we went to the English Channel to go to the uh, Pacific. You know, uh, uh, does it say in there? It well, says you were down in Guantanamo Bay in Cuba. Huh? You were visited Guantanamo Bay in well, Cuba. Well, that was that was when we were uh, when we got a brand new ship and we were. Um, we were uh, what shakedown crews. In other words, we were testing the ship. Was it was this was the new ship also the roads was also yeah. Uh -huh. Why did they change the ship? Was it damaged or they just? No. What, what do you mean change? When you said you got the new ship. No, no. When we first got the ship out of the shipyard. They oh. We went to Bermuda and Guantanamo Bay as a cruise. You know, and we were doing all kinds of, uh, of, um, uh, of exercises. Yeah. You know, then they had planes flying over, and and they had this sleeve. You know, did you ever see one of those sleeves? And then you were you sh were shooting at the sleeve. You know. Oh, it pulls it through the air. Yeah. I yes. It was it was just a exercise. To get us used to yeah. firing those guns. Yeah. Well, then, when you went to the Pacific, did you go back 
down there past Cuba to the Panama Canal and then out into the Pacific Ocean to no, get to China? No, no. no. Let, let me see what, if there's anything in here. Yeah, I just wonder how you got over into China. Well, well yeah, we, first we went to the Aleutians. We were in the Aleutians for a while. And we were doing what they call plane guard duty. And because they were bombarding Japan and uh, those planes knocked down and then our job was to get the pilots out of the water. I'm trying to see. Oh. Hold on. This is, uh, this is when we were coming back. Oh, here. Well, right. Yeah, March of 45, you leave. Uh, yeah. Southampton, England. I'm trying to find out when we went into the... Uh, see, here we went to Wales. Oh, yes, Cardiff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, wait a minute. We didn't go to Guantanamo Bay. We went there <coughs> after... Um, Yeah, perhaps he went by there on the way to the Panama Canal. Yeah, I'm 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 trying to figure out when we went to Guantanamo Bay. Yeah, they got a date here. Of, yeah, uh, yeah, June forty-five. 45. That yeah. was almost the war was almost over. Right. Mm-hmm. That's why it sounds like they're they're redeploying people from the Atlantic to the Pacific or something. We we were playing. Uh, Yeah, I see. This is the one uh, weather patrol that was up in the Aleutians at two, and then you know here they don't tell this in there, <laughs> but we anchored in Hitchin Cook, Isle in Alaska, and we were, you know. That's when MacArthur flew from Washington <coughs> to, to Tokyo to sign the papers for the signing of the... And, you know, they had ships all along. If anything happened to his plane, there was a ship there in the water. Do you realize how much that cost? All the way across. They yeah. had and then ready. they show him... Getting a uh, walking in the water, and you know, remember those? Times? Oh, I have returned yet. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and and I I talked to some people that were there, and they said that he didn't have to get in the water. <laughs> you know, I mean. Yeah, it seemed like he had an eye for uh, oh, a, a good camera. photograph. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, he knew how well it would play. Yeah, and seeing in 1946. We came back to the Panama and went to uh, Charleston, South Carolina, and then departed the same thing. That's when I got off the ship because they were going to put it in mothballs. You know what they meant by mothballs, storing it. You know that that was uh, when we got to Charleston. That was the last of the ship. That was in '46. Like I say, you could make a big story out of this, just these ports that I'm telling you about, you know? Right, yeah. Yeah. What did you say from Casablanca to China, right? Huh? You said from Casablanca to China. Right. Yeah. So you were in, um, <coughs> you you arrived in Okinawa? Yeah. In Tsingtao? Tsingtao was China. Yeah. That must have been uh, an yeah. eye opener. Or oh yeah, we went. We went right. Uh, we we got on. <laughs> we we went up the Chinese. What was that river? I can't remember. Uh, well, it doesn't. 
Let's see, it doesn't say that in here, but we were going to, um, uh, for liberty, when we got to China, you know, the war was over, you know, and we were an army of occupation. And uh, so we, they were giving us the liberty to go up into, uh, into the Tsingtao, that was a big city, like, you know, and uh, the, so we had to take an LST down the river to uh, to Sing Tao and uh, spend the, and so the, the, the uh, cooks fixed us sandwiches, you know, and they put pounds of butter, you know, just a hunk of butter on there. And uh, so when we got on the train, and to go to uh, get off the uh, LST and got on the train, we uh, we were passing out the sandwiches among, and there was a lot of the, uh, Chinese people on there too, uh, on this train. And this one guy was looking at us, and and they, he saw that butter, and and we said, you know, we couldn't talk to them. We didn't know how to talk to them. But we gave him, and he started eating it. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah, we had a lot of, oh, you should see the beautiful stuff we bought in China to take home. Uh, everything was silk. You know, I bought a Kimon, uh house coat for my sister uh, at the time, and uh, I sent it to her. She couldn't wear it out. That was pure silk. You know. Is that where you saw the um, the rickshaw? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And how much a day was it? To, how much was it to rent? Thirty-five cents a day, and he stayed there from morning till night. Wow. If you went into your hotel, he sat there. Yeah. But then the army of occupation come in there, and they ruined everything. They said throwing money around like water, and Everything was so expensive then. Yeah. So when um, so you must have all been really happy to learn that the war was coming to an end, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. But y you enlisted, so d you had to serve a particular length of time because you had enlisted. You have to serve four years or active duty or inactive. Well, or? I can't remember. No, I wasn't in there for four years. No, so. about three and a half maybe. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. And uh, well, I, uh, the only thing I know is that when I was in China, my orders to, to be discharged was come through. And I, uh, uh, yeah, and my orders, but see, they could. They held us what for 90 days. In other words, they, they, when your orders came through, they they couldn't take everybody and send them home because they needed somebody to run the ship. Yeah. You know? So uh, they, I was held back 90 days, and then when we were in uh, in China, um, my orders came through, and and so did the ships orders come through that they are we're gonna go home so the captain called me in and said you know I know uh, we could put you ashore here and you take your chances how you're gonna get home <laughs> because you know you could get on a on a, a aircraft you could get on a, a freighter you, you don't know what you know I said no I'll stay with the ship and I stayed with the ship all the until we got to South Carolina. You saw you for those uh, between the ages there, like twenty and uh, twenty-three and a half. You saw so much of the world and covered yeah. so many miles. No, well, we went in. We were in England. We went to New uh, London and everything. It was. It must have been a wonderful experience. Yeah. You know, like one guy said to me, he says, it's a wonderful experience, but I wouldn't do it again. <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> Were there any uh, very funny moments you remember or uh, well, any memorable experiences? That there was a lot of funny things, but I can't. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
Did you ever go back to any of those places that you visited? No, not a, not across the ocean. No. Would I, you want to go back if you could go back to any of those places? I would places? love to go back. To where? All of them, or some of them, or? No, I never did. Never. Because, <clears throat> well, I wasn't married at the time, but uh, I had no interest in going back. You know, yeah. not at that time. So, you stay with the. Uh, the USS Rhodes back to Charleston. Charleston. And, and then I, you're mustered out there or discharged? At uh, and, no, they put us on a train and took us to Detroit. Detroit? And that was our discharge point. And they uh, gave us uh, a fare to go home, you know. In fact, I was. I don't know if I took it with me. I, I, I just saw it today. I didn't even know I had it. It was a uh, ticket to go from uh, uh, South Carolina, no, from Detroit to Chicago on a train, you know. And, you know, I don't even remember who met me at the train station, you know. Your family must have been delighted. Did they meet you at the station, your family? That's what I say. You I don't, don't remember, remember yeah. this, you know. Yeah. So did you have any? Uh, did you have a hard time adjusting to adjusting to civilian life? Not really. No. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I I I I was electrician, you know, for 40 years, and uh, I uh, I was just lucky to uh, get get started in that. And uh, I went to apprentice school and everything, you know. And so you didn't have. Too hard, too, it wasn't that difficult to find employment then after the war? Or was it a little hard to get a job? Well, you know, they told me that I should go back to my old job. Right. You know, and then they, were, they, they gave me something like three or four weeks vacation that was, I was entitled to. So I went there <coughs> and I got the four weeks and then I quit. And my father was in the trucking business, and he gave me a job on one of the trucks, and I didn't like it. I said, "Not this is not for me." So, uh, so then uh, I was I was in between going to, to school for to be a salesman, because uh, I went to back to DePaul, and I wanted to know if I could continue my studying, you know, and uh, and then they suggested that I go into some company, you know, some company that has a sales program that trains you to be salesmen. And, and so uh, my uncle was big in the meatpacking company, uh, and Wilson and Company, I don't know if you ever heard of them. Well, they uh, were a big meatpacking company, and they had a program going. So. It was either being me being an electrician or a salesman for uh, meat packing, and uh, I finally decided I wanted the electrician's job. So that that's what I did. So did you um, did you stay in, con in in did you stay in contact with some of your friends from the Coast Guard, some of your oh, buddies? Oh yeah, mm -hmm. and I you know I had the we had 12 reunions, and you know, I, I, I start, you know how I started? I met this fellow Galassi. Now, Mr. Galassi, it turns out, yeah, he, he lives he, in Niles. Yeah, and uh, I went to the church, and they were, uh, not to the church, but to this uh, men's meeting, and they, uh, and and they uh, were discussing uh, reunions, you know, between, you know, they were those tables, you know, and surely, and, and uh, I didn't know him, I didn't know Galassi, I knew this other fellow that was on another ship. His name is uh, Ed Lesniak, but he's uh, in a hospital and he's in bad shape, and uh, he he's the guy I knew. And I said to him, I says, Ed, what are you talking about the Southstrom? He says, well, Galassi was on the Southstrom. 
I said, that was our flagship. You know, see, we, we traveled in a group, and we were Division 23, see? And he, he uh, so I asked, I said, talking to him, today I'm one of his best buddies. Yeah, <laughs> small world. Yeah, and uh, that's how we got started, you know, and uh, and they helped me find people from my ship. They uh, they wrote to the uh, the Navy archives, and they gave us a listing of all the guys on our ship, and we went through the we went through telephone books. Oh, I bet, yeah. Telephone books, looking for people with names. If you ran into a Sullivan, forget it, because you know how many Sullivans. But anyway, we I, I accumulated uh, something like over a hundred people. And, you know, I called people, and, you know, I, I didn't know who I was going to, you know, I called them, you know, and uh, they, the, uh, and I'd say, well, can I talk to so-and-so, and he said, and he said, and I named, I mentioned my name, oh, you know, you know, wow. oh, they were so excited about it, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, uh. So then you organized these 12 reunions yeah, around the country? Yeah. The first, the, the first to get together was in St. Louis. We went there, and uh, we dedicated a model ship. Not us, but th this one ship uh, took that on as a project, you know. And uh, they got the high school kids from uh, Arizona. Now I don't know how this happened, but. You should see the beautiful model they made. Oh, it was nine feet long, and they were going to put it, they put it on this uh, aircraft carrier that they turned into a uh, museum in uh, New York, and they left it there. And that was our first reunion, the first get together. And was that like in 19? What year would that have been? Do you think? I have all those dates, yeah. but I don't have them with me. You think it was in the 1950s, do you think? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. In the 50s. Yeah, no, it is maybe 60s. The 60s. And you're also a member of the VFW here in Niles, right? VFW, American Legion, you name it, you know. And then I belong to the Destroyer Escort Association. And then I belong to the Florida... Uh, see, there's Florida is the national headquarters for Destroyer Escort Sailors Association. NIDESA is Northern Illinois De DESA. So there's two different organizations. One is, we are a charter, uh, chapter of the national headquarters. And uh, we even brought back one of the ships from, from the Greeks and uh, and uh, they, we, they did, you know, we gave away all those ships. All those ships we gave away, we, we said we'd never have to use them again. And so this one was in Greece. And they told it, they told it back to, the, to this country. And, and uh, I'll, I'll give you uh, one of their newspapers and show you what they're they're doing with the uh, with the they overhauled it. They got parts from all these companies free, and they're all they needed was people to do it, and that's the big thing. It cost us a million dollars to tow that thing from uh, from Greece. And that's down in Florida now. No, it's in it's in uh, New Buffalo, New York. Oh, Buffalo, New York. It's. It's uh, it's it's a museum there now, and uh, they get people going there every year, they volunteer to work there for a week, three days, paint, and they're painting, doing everything for the ship. See, because the government doesn't give us anything. The um, how do you think um, your your service in the military affected your? your life or your outlook on life? I don't think it had any effect on me at all. Not at all. Because I didn't follow up anything that uh, from the service, you know. 
because I I actually I actually was uh, I was in the radio room of our ship, and it I uh, I was what they call a uh, radio man striker. Is that what you did most of the time? Yeah. When, so you weren't always the um, Jack. That was a very short short time. Most of the time you were radio. Uh, they uh, they radio. you a striker in the radio room. What they mean is is like an apprentice in the radio room. And uh, I, uh, what I, boy, did I go through already? Yeah, we're uh, just moving over now on to uh, side two. Sorry for the uh -huh. interruption. So you were a striker, too? Uh -huh. You were a striker in the... Yeah, I was a radioman striker. In other words, I had to do all, all the paperwork for them, and uh, we even helped with decoding messages. You know, me <coughs> you know how they worked it. They used to... Uh, there was... Nobody could send a message off their ship. Nobody. It was what they call radio silence, and what they they did is they had radio New York and radio San Francisco, and they were the ones that sent out the messages, and it was up to the ships to pick up these messages, what they were sending out. It was a lot of weather reports and a lot of things, you know, and. Uh, so you had to copy all these messages, not the message, the heading of this uh, of the uh, message. If it if it didn't pertain to you, you didn't uh, you didn't type it out. So so was there a code book that you yeah. had to use? Yeah, it was a code. What kind of code was it? As? Oh, it was very complicated. No, nobody, even the Japanese couldn't figure it out. Yeah. So, you must have known about some things before everybody else on the ship did, oh, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, it was funny because the captain always called me in one time and he says, who are you? And I says, why? He says, you're always being paged. I says, well, I'm, I'm in the radio room and, you know, they're, they're always needing me or something, you know. So, so did your time on duty then with, with your different shifts in the in the radio room like you might be on through the night or a what when you did you have certain shifts that you had to cover certain time periods you had to be on duty in the radio room oh yeah you had it was uh, four and eight, uh, what they call four hours on and eight hours off that was the schedule so sometimes you'd be working at night yeah oh yeah <laughs> 24 hours a day. You you couldn't even light a cigarette on the outside of the ship yeah. because uh, the submarines could pick that up. Yeah. So did you, did they have beer on the ship? They did, but it uh, it wasn't available only in port. Uh, did know? they show you movies on the ship? Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But. Uh, they didn't show them uh, when we were at sea because the ship moved so much, you know. Yeah. And we didn't have any high-class uh, equipment for that. So was it, how did people relax? Did they play a lot of cards or yeah. read or? Dice, dice, everything, gambling, you know. On your ship, did they do any of those... Um, like when you're crossing the equator for the first time or something, did they play tricks on you? No, know, we never passed. We never crossed the equator. Uh -huh. We we crossed the time zone, but not the equator. So nobody played any tricks on people. No, no, or we didn't. Dunked them in the water or something. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how much more I could tell you. And uh, well, that's a we'll lot. see what you come up with. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think we're probably coming to the end of the uh, of the interview. 
Is there anything that you'd like to add that we haven't talked about or that comes to mind? As I say, we can always add something to this if, if, if you think there's something important. Well, there's nothing important, Not, but uh, there was a lot of things that went on, you know, that, you know, like, uh, I'll never forget I, this guy, he was a quartermaster, and he was a little guy, you know, and he was so drunk. I brought him back on my shoulder, <laughs> you know, I mean, things like that w w happened, you know. Yeah. But you seem to have, it was, it's, you seem to be very happy to, rec to, oh, yeah. yeah, it was, we didn't it was a have a happy experience, yeah. yeah. You know, we didn't, uh, we did, there was nothing bitter yeah. b among the men, you know. And it was a well-run ship, and, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. and, um, did you enjoy meeting all these different people from different parts of the country? Oh, yeah. You wouldn't believe how successful some of these people are that uh, uh, were on our ship. You know, they were ordinary sailors, and then all of a sudden they, they were very successful. One, one guy, he owned a printing company after he left uh, the ship, you know. I, I contacted and uh, when we got to the reunion, this is what some of these guys were doing. Well, Mr. Plasinski, thank you very much for coming in. I, uh, I, I hope I helped you. You did. It's wonderful. I didn't realize the uh, the Coast Guard actually staffed Navy ships. Because I, I have interviewed men who were in the one of destroyer escorts, but they were Navy guys. I didn't know the Coast Guard did it. Oh, I yeah. couldn't figure that out. And. Uh, and you were in the Atlantic and the Mediterranean and the Pacific and the China Sea, yeah. and that's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. You've covered a lot of miles. Oh yeah, it was, you know, it, you you know, you pulled into some of these, you know, like uh, Okinawa. That was a disaster, you know, because uh, they they had a big battle right in the in the bay, you know, and there were ships sunk all over, you know. And then we ran into a typhoon. Oh. The, uh, they, just, they gave us orders, everybody to leave the port, because it was safer for us to be out in the ocean than it was in the... Uh, harbor. In the harbor. In fact, when we came back... <coughs> When we came back from the um, uh, when we when uh, they send us out uh, out of the port, uh, harbor, we went out, and uh, after the storm was passed by, we came back in. There were some of these big freighters, you know, like you see in pictures were turned over from the typhoon. Wow. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mr. Bozinski, you said something um, that when you were discharged, they gave you an interesting physical. Yeah. What was that? I, I said, you know, what I told you, that they lined us up, and we were all nude, you know, and this doctor walked down the aisle, you know, it was, he was a line of men from here to that other wall, and the doctor would walk, you know, you were facing each other, all right? And he, the doctor would walk down the aisle, uh, and then he'd say, reverse, uh, um, how do you, do you... About face or something? Uh, about face. And then he'd come back out and he said, okay, you guys are all all right, you can go home. <laughs> That was an easy physical. Yeah. yeah. I wanted to tell you one more thing. And I, uh, you interrupted me now. I forgot uh, about this, you know. I can't think of it now. Okinawa and the freighters and the typhoon? Oh, yeah. This is a real touching story. Um, we pulled into Okinawa, see. And uh, this, one of the fellows on our ship's brother was on Okinawa. And he asked the captain if he could go ashore and uh, and see if he can find his brother. He did. He brought him back to the ship. And uh, so the, 
the captain says, well, what would you like to eat? He says, what do you mean? He's been on K-rations for all these months, or I don't know. And uh, so, you know, we had fresh eggs, and we had, you know, I mean, we lived like kings compared to them. And uh, we made them, I think, breakfast or something, I don't know, with egg, fresh eggs and milk and everything, you know. And uh, it was very touchy to see this guy enjoy him. And then he had to go back. <laughs> so he would have been a Navy man then? Or was he Navy or Army? No, no, he was in the Marine. He was a Marine. Yeah. Mm. That's all that was on the Okinawa. Okinawa. Yeah. So uh, I, what I'll do is I'll see if I can find some... Uh, you want this picture, right? Yeah, if, I, I, I think I'll stop the tape recorder now and say thank you. And then I'll go upstairs and I'll scan this and I'll make some mm -hmm. photocopies. If, you want this picture of the rickshaw? Oh, I want to scan that, yeah, mm -hmm. if I may. So I'm going to turn off the recording now. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Okay. Testing, one, two, three. Testing, one, two, three.